What is good, guys? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> we are here to talk about an album that most people don't really look too fondly of, but I think I'm going to try to defend its case here, and that is going to be 2000's Motley Crue's New Tattoo. So this one here is the album that came after the reunited Motley Crue of 1997, Generation Swine, which a lot of people don't really like at all either. And a couple years later, they put out this album. Now this album does not have Tommy Lee on it, which is the first and only album without Tommy Lee. And we bring in Randy Castillo, and he comes from the likes of like Lita Ford and uh, Ozzy Osbourne. So, but you still have the other guys, Mick Mars, Nikki Six, and Vince Neil. And I will say, Mick Mars says that he ha- actually didn't have too much uh, work to do on this album. Now, which is kind of surprising to me because I actually do like the guitar work on here, especially when you compare it to 1997 album Generation Swine. Because in, on that album, Mick Mars makes it fully known that he. They told him basically not to play the guitar, how Mick Mars plays, which is a crime in and of itself. What? I don't, and he kind of, Mick, Mick mentioned on this album was somewhat the same, like they didn't really ask him to do much, not to say not to do anything, but he was still kind of like in limbo apparently. So, but which is kind of strange because I, I don't see anyone else being credited with guitar work on here. But Mick Mars says he only had like a few licks on this album, so which is kind of strange. But either way, I like the guitar work on this album. But now, as far as this album goes, it did come out, like I said, in 2000, which is still very early for any kind of like renaissance of hair metal or anything like that. It's it was still like not the cool thing because you still had like new metal going on at that time and a lot of different things, as we know. the like hair metal renaissance and sleaze metal renaissance from other countries, like from Europe, Sweden stuff, they were just starting to start get big even over there and over here. So and then Motley Crue releases something that goes back to their roots somewhat. And I think it was just the wrong time. Now, say if this album came out a couple of years later, maybe it does have some legs. It certainly has more legs than piece of shit that came out after it which is saints of los angeles look like garbage (laughs) i am not a fan of that album just sounds like a 6 a.m album to me and i mean vince doesn't really sound too good on that album i I just don't care for that album much when you're comparing it to new tattoo so it but it did reach number 40 in the top 200 billboard charts and which is half decent uh, at the time i think it told it sold like 300,000 copies if i'm not mistaken so it didn't go gold or platinum or anything like that. But I remember, if anyone remembers FYE or The Wall, I remember going there when I was like 12, 13 years old, and they had like a little wall of cassettes, brand new cassettes there still, and they, they were like half off or like real cheap. And I remember seeing this there, and I was like, oh, you know what, I, I knew Motley Crue. Like, I, I mean, I, I probably had to like their greatest hits at that point, being only 12 or 13 just starting to get my feet wet with them. And I was like, okay, let's like, let's pick this up and see what we got. And I actually enjoyed it for the most part. I mean, I, I didn't love it. I loved the other stuff more at the time, but I didn't hate it though either. I listened to it for a couple of weeks. And I was like, all right, this is all right. You know, I, I can, I can get behind it, especially for being something somewhat new because when I was 12 or 13, what was that? 2005 ish. So it was, relatively new at the time compared to say shout out the devil but I, I you know for being somewhat new coming from an old band i was happy with it uh and i still am actually but so you had a couple singles here hell on high heels which they did do a music video for very good song i like it one of my now i wouldn't say maybe not my one of my favorites it might not make a top five ranking for me as far as a uh, song goes but i still really enjoy it a lot when it comes on i'm like okay this you know Kind of like a deep cut, if you will. And then you got the title track, New Tattoo, which is like a ballad as a single. And then also they released, uh, as far as like a promo, I believe, uh, the Treat Treat Me Like the Dog I Am, which is just okay. Uh, I can give or take that song. So, yeah, I mean, we're coming in here 
a lot of people like to say that uh, Motley Crue was trying to go back to their roots here for the most part. And I would agree with that because like what we get with whether what, what doesn't matter what you think of 1994, John Karabi's 1994 album. I absolutely love that album. I think it's probably Motley Crue's best work that they ever did. And I love it. But when you talk about 1994, 1997, Generation Swine, that was like a line there to where people were like, okay, Motley Crue, the old, where, where people like to say new Motley Crue and old Motley Crue. So, you know, it's it, me, I think of all the new Motley Crue stuff, excluding John Karabi, all the new Vince Neil stuff, Hell on High, or New Tattoo is certainly up there, if not my favorite. Uh, I think it, they do go back to kind of like what they did with Too Fast for Love, but mix like some of these songs on here kind of could fit on the album after Dr. Feel Good, like in 1992 when we got Primal Scream, when we got Teaser, when we got Angela off of the Decadive Decadence album or compilation or whatever. I, I, I think Motley Crue would have had a killer album in 1991, 1992 after Dr. Feel Good with that sleaziness, like with all what was going on in rock and metal at the time with the sleaze, with just that badass, like just bluesiness going on in the early nineties. I think it would have been awesome, uh, but we never end up getting that. And all we got was that crappy <laughs> Vince Neil exposed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am not a fan of Vince, Vince, Vince Neal's Exposed. I don't know. I mean, I'm just not the biggest fan of Vince Neal to begin with, so maybe that's what it is. But you know, you would think with an all-star lineup like that in on that album, Exposed, it would be awesome. But I just it does not work for me, and I can't say too ma- too much good about it. There's not like more than two songs that I can honestly remember right now to talk to somebody about the album and be like, oh yeah, I like that song or I like that song about this song. You know, no. It doesn't work. What's up, everybody? This is Jaron Galino from Lynch Mob and Heaven's Edge, and you're watching the Crash Course Metal Show with my boy, Trevor Crash Knight. Crank it up. So let's talk a little bit here about some of the standout tracks. Like I said, the first single, Hell on High Heels, starts out the album awesome. Uh, The only, actually, I will say two songs that aren't on the iPod that are kind of just like okay to me and I don't really need to hear again are Dream Me Like the Dog I Am and Drag Strip Superstar. Drexip Superstar is kind of like a it gets a little repetitive for me. But bands up or but songs that I do like, She Needs Rock and Roll, Punch in the Teeth by Love, uh, Fake, Porno Star. Fake reminds me of one of the songs that would have been on the 1992 album, you know, on for Motley Crue, if they never would have broke up. Uh that's like a classic example of a song that would be on there. And then they do a cover here, the last track, White Punks on Dope. I actually didn't realize that was a cover until a couple years ago, but I like it. I like their version of it. I I think they make it their own. I dig it. I like it a lot. Uh, But, I mean, you have two ballads here, New Tattoo title track, and then you have Hollywood Ending, which I think I would prefer Hollywood Ending. I mean, let's be honest here, guys. Molly Crew does not have the strongest ballad catalog so it's not very hard to beat uh but these are two that are somewhat still fresh to me like sometimes they do get skipped but i'll listen to one of these over without you or that piece of shit brandon off of 97 (laughs) or even like at this point home sweet home just because home sweet home is so overplayed i i have no interest in hearing that song again but i mean it, the, the ballads are okay here. I mean, I'm not going to, they're not in a top 50 or 100 ranking of mine for ballads, but, you know, they're, they're listenable. Uh, they, they work for the time and such. But that's another point, too. I, you know, I think being two, in the year 2000, I think you can't ask for much more than what this album gives us. Uh, you know, because if, if the roles were reversed and new tattoo comes out in 2008 instead of saints of los angeles i think more fans would have been more open to this album to new tattoo than say saints of los angeles i remember when saints of los angeles came out i was what 16 years old i i like the title track the, the first single off of that 
But everything else just seems really forced and really not right. I, I don't know. It just like I said, it's kind of like a six a.m. album. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I just don't want Molly Crew doing six a.m. I, I don't like that. Uh, Mick Mars, that, that's not what he's supposed to be doing. And another point though to this, I'm kind of glad Tommy Lee left because at this point, like. Tommy Lee was doing that industrial new metal rap bullshit, and I think it would have just totally ruined the fun, the fun that's on this album. That's another. That's one of the keywords here. That this does go back to a fun album, fun songs. Yes, there are tongue in cheek, kind of childish lyrics on some of these songs, but I think at the end of the day, that's what works to an extent. Now, if everything was just all that, I would say okay, a little bit too much there. But I think when you're coming from 94 to 97, like those kind of albums, darker, and it's certainly for 1997, just weird, different stuff. Now, I don't I don't hate Generation Swine like everyone else does, but it's certainly not Motley Crue. Uh, and I think out of the two, this is certainly more Motley Crue than anything else that they did since Dr. Feelgood. Vince Neil now era Vince Neil wise, and I don't know. I I just don't like. So a lot of people just overlook this album. I don't know if it's necessarily hate for it. I don't know if it's just overlooked or just you know. And and that's a shame too because this is probably the last album that Vince Neil actually sounds good on. Pretty good. I mean, yes, Vince Neil never was the best singer or anything, but like during the eighties, like people loved him. He was the man. And, you know, I don't know if it's just the production on 97, Generation Swine, that you can't really tell on his voice, like, how strong it is, like, what what are we looking at here, or what are we hearing? But I think this is, I mean, Vince Neil still looks the part here on New Tattoo, and then everything after this album, he sounds the part, he looks the part, and then after that, that's when he started really going downhill to the meme and the joke that we all love today to make fun of as Vince Neil. So, but uh, Vince Neil is one of the godfathers, you know, one of the OGs. He, he did his part. He had his fun. He had his time. And now he can just relax and do whatever the fuck he wants. Cause people are still going to go out and pay to go watch him, watch him live. So good on him, whatever. That's cool. But yeah, I, I mean, I like it. I, I think Randy does a great job on drums here. Uh, filling in for Tommy Lee. I think that's what, the album needed i think that's what motley crew probably needed too and it's just a shame randy ended up passing away soon shortly after this album and who knows maybe tommy lee might have never came back you know we don't know and another thing with the uh cover art here now everyone knows the one side of the story of bruce dickinson making his first solo album uh tattooed millionaire about Nikki Six and like his wife cheating on him for Nikki Six and stuff like that. And then the cover though here is if anyone remembers the Bruce Dixon debut album, it has like that Chinese woman on it, like with the dragon and stuff like that. And I think it seems to it seems like this is a little bit of a something a pushback to Bruce Dickinson, like inspired by, you know, to for that. I don't know, just just it's kind of like a thought, and just I seen a couple people mention that, and I'm like, you know what, you're probably right because this is kind of like a strange, uh, cover here artwork for Motley Crue. You know, even when I was young, when I first seen, it, I'm like, oh, this seems a little different. Like, why why are we on like the Chinese? Is this gonna be like Chinese influence or you know like some shit like that? But no, it's not at all. But I think it might have something to do with the Bruce Dickinson uh scuffle and such so but for me guys new tattoo i i honestly don't remember where i ranked it in my motley crew discography ranking and if you guys want to check that out check that out i'll put it right here but i don't i ranked it like halfway decent but i can't remember exactly where but to me though out of all the new era motley crew the reunion era motley crew vince neil reunion era this has to be my favorite one and I mean, that's not saying a whole lot, but I actually, like I said, I do enjoy this album. I, I give it a three out of five. I like it. I like it a good amount. It, whenever I do listen to Motley Crue, I don't 
usually go to I usually go to like about three albums now, and I think you know it's certainly one of these, uh, or most of the time I go to ninety nineteen ninety four. Even like Theo of Pain, Shout Out the Devil. But once in a while, if I don't go to those three or four, I, I'll go to New Tattoo. And I am like, okay, I don't need to keep listening to it, but it's all right. You know, I like to listen to it once in a while and be like, okay, I, they, they had a little something left there, but apparently no one wanted to listen to it at the time. So that is the crime here. So yeah, three out of five guys, uh, not, not too great. But not bad either. Uh, you can certainly find worse in the Molly Crew discography, uh, no doubt, than New Tattoo. Uh, yeah, the guitar works fine too, and which that really shocked me with when Mick Mars said about he didn't really do too much guitar work on this. But like, there's solos on here that I like. There's riffs on here that I like. I think it's just going back to the going back to the roots for Molly Crew. There's a little bit of punk. In some of these songs, like a trace of elements of punk, and which I'm not usually a big fan of, but I mean, hey, that is what somewhat too fast for love is a little bit too. You could certainly hear influence of punk on that album, and you get a little bit of that here. So you, I, I think I think new tattoo works. I think Molly Crew, if they would have kind of stayed on this pace here, but I think Brandy possibly had something to do with that as well. So we'll never truly know, I guess, but. I like it, guys. Uh, 11 tracks, pretty sweet and to the point. 40 minutes, a little over 40 minutes long, so uh, not too much. Maybe take one or two tracks off and you'll have a really good album. But other than that, three out of five, guys. And let me know in the comments what you guys think of New Tattoo and just the new reunion, post-reunion era of Motley Crue and the albums and just music in general that they released since then. Talk to me. Thank you for watching the Crash Course Metal Show. Hang out with us, subscribe, party with us for a little while, and guys, stay out of that collateral damage. And until next time, if you guys enjoyed this video, check out this one right here. Yeah, I wrote that. It's called, I want to rock your body. And then in parentheses, it says, to the break of dawn.